Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about finding points of interest. We often want to find the interesting points on a graph, places where something special occurs. A graphing calculator will allow us to easily find these locations. You can use a graphing calculator to find things like roots or zeros, same name, just different ways of, same thing, just different names. The locations where our function is equal to zero, you can use it to find relative minimums, sometimes just called min, which is the lowest local value in an area. Relative maximums, sometimes just called max, the highest local value in an area and intersections, the location where two functions intersect each other. The specific menu to get access to these varies from one calculator to another, but the menu choices should look something like these things right here, zero, min, max, intersection. If you can find a section like that, you found the part where you can get that information out of your calculator. You set up your function, then choose whichever one you want to use. It's important to note that all of these are, well, usually solved numerically. Some calculators can solve them precisely, but most graphing calculators will solve them numerically. That is to say, you'll get answers that are accurate up to quite a few decimals. You'll be able to get four or five decimals worth of accuracy, maybe even more, but they won't necessarily be perfectly precise, right? It's like the difference between saying pi and saying 3.1415, right? 3.1415 is a very good approximation of pi, but there's still more precision in the actual number of pi. So the answer that you get from your calculator when you use things for roots, zeros, relative minimum, maximums, intersections, things like that. They'll be good answers, but they won't necessarily be perfect answers. They'll be approximations, and that's something you want to keep in mind sometimes. So how do we actually find a point of interest with a graphing calculator? For most points of interest, the process is going to go like this. You start off by graphing the function. Now, in this specific case, I actually graphed a parabola. And I knew that because I knew I had x squared at the front of it and then some other stuff. But when I graphed it, I see that I get this on my graphing calculator screen. So instead, what I want to do is I might, this is parts optional, but I might want to resize my viewing window so I can see more of what's going on. So I can adjust the viewing window, and I see, ah, yeah, it's a parabola, right? And so I've got a bunch more stuff going on here. It's not just a straight line I'm working with. I'm working with a parabola. So you can adjust your viewing window. Depending on the situation, you might not need to adjust the viewing window. For example, if you're looking for a zero at some specific area, you know it's going to be between an x interval of like 2 and 5. You don't really care about a window any, far, any farther than going from x interval of 2 to 5 because that's all you're looking for, right? And you know that your y's really only have to be near zero because you're looking for a root. But depending on the situation, it can be useful to see the entire thing, or at least a good sense of how the function works before moving on. Next, you choose the point of interest type, what you're specifically looking for. In this case, let's say we're looking for a root, and we want to find out what this root is, that one right there. So we go to the menu, we choose zero. At that point, you identify where the search should occur. This won't be necessarily on all graphing calculators, but many graphing calculators will, will require you to put an interval of what is the lowest place that we can look from and the highest point that we're looking to, right? What is the lowest x value that we have to look from and the highest x value that we're going to work up to? And then it will search within that interval. So we start off and we say, we know that it's going to be above here and below here for those x intervals. So we're just looking somewhere inside of this interval. Next, you give your graphing calculator a guess. You don't necessarily have to have your guess be perfect. It doesn't have to be right on top of the thing you're going for. But the closer it is to where you're going, the faster your graphing calculator will be able to figure it out. The algorithms that it's using to actually figure this out, it just starts from somewhere that you tell it to start, and then it works out either way effectively. So it works out from some starting place. So if your starting place is closer to where you're going, it'll make it a faster process. So we choose some guess somewhere, and then it cranks through it and it gets us an answer. Yay, we've got a result. And it will display it either somewhere on your graph. It might display it next to the point. It might display it at the bottom of the window, the top. It depends on your specific calculator. But it will punch out some value. And so in this case, we managed to get that it happens at 2.81. So we have three decimal places of accuracy. The process works pretty much just like this for if you're looking for the zero, the minimum, or the maximum. But it works a little bit differently if you're looking for the intersection of two functions. For that, you graph both functions. So you'll have to graph one of the functions, and then you choose another. You set another function graphing the other one. Then you'll choose intersect in your menu, right? You choose your point of interest type. You identify the two functions. So instead of identifying where the search occurs between what locations, you say, here's the first function I care about, here's the second function. I care about, and then you give some guess 
of about where you think the intersection occurs. And then once again, it runs through some algorithm and it figures out where is the actual intersection. There's some advanced techniques that we can talk about as well. One thing that you might want to do is you might want to be able to solve for an arbitrary location, arbitrary um, output value on a function. So occasionally you need to solve some function and find out what input value will give a certain output. For example, we might have the function f of x equals x cubed minus 27x squared plus 9. And we want to find all the x values such that f of x equals 419, all the values that we can plug in and get 419 out of it. In other words, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find all the solutions to 419 equals x cubed minus 27x squared plus 9. If you're not sure why that is, well, we've got f of x here and f of x here. What we want f of x to be is 419, so we swap it out here, and we've got the equation 419 equals x cubed minus 27x squared plus 9. So we're effectively just looking to solve this equation. What are all the x values that get this equation solved? we can use a graphing calculator to quickly find a close approximation. So we can write the above as 0 equals x cubed minus 27x squared plus 9 minus 419. We're just moving the 419 to the other side of the equation through subtraction. Now at this point, if we've got 0 equals this stuff, well what we can do is we can say, hey, let's just make this y equals this stuff. So we swap out the 0 for a y, and now we've got something that we can graph. We can graph y equals x cubed minus 27x squared plus 9 minus 419. So we plug that into our graphing calculator, and we use the calculator to solve for all zeros. Because if we find a 0, if if we find each of the zeros to this equation right here, if we find 0 equals this equation, well then we will have satisfied this equation. And if we've satisfied that equation, we know that we've satisfied that equation. And if we've satisfied that equation, we've figured out all of the places where f of x equals 419, and so we're done. So this is a really great way if you want to just figure out what values will what input values will cause a function to give certain output values, you can work through this method and you can solve arbitrarily for anything. It's pretty great. Another advanced technique to know about is for calculus. If you look in the menu that allows you to find the various points of interest, you'll normally also find some options for calculus. The derivative dy over dx, that finds a numerical approximation of the derivative at the point you choose. Once again, it's not a precise value, but it's a pretty good numerical approximation. And the integral, find a numerical approximation, once again, not the precise value, but a good approximation of the definite integral for the interval you choose. That's all of the area underneath some starting location to some ending location underneath your curve. Now, don't worry if these options don't really make sense to you right now. That's perfectly fine. This is for a future course when you get into calculus. It's some interesting stuff now, but don't worry about it right now. You'll be learning about these things later on in a calculus course. But when you get to calculus, keep them in mind. Keep the fact that your, your calculator has the ability to figure out derivatives. It has the ability to figure out integrals. They can be really handy for checking your work or for solving difficult problems when you're in a calculus class. They can really help you out in that place. Finally, how do you show your work with this stuff? The problem with all these methods, and rightly so, is that you don't really do any solving on your own. You're just letting the calculator do all the work for you. Well, that's okay in some situations. You still should be able to work out solutions for problems like this on your own. This means you should be able to do this without a calculator, too. So most teachers won't accept, because my calculator said so, as the work for an answer. Most teachers are going to say, no, you have to be able to solve this on your own, not just rely on a calculator being able to do it. And that's perfectly reasonable. The point of being in math class is to be able to understand how this stuff works. And if we're completely relying on a calculator, it's not that great. You don't want to become dependent on your calculator for all your solving. You can use it as a way to check your work or solve a problem that you can't figure out algebraically right now, but don't let it become a crutch that replaces thinking. You want your calculator to be a tool that helps you do math, but not the only way that you can do math. It's a great tool, but if it winds up replacing all of your ability to solve stuff on your own, that's kind of not what you're going for. You really want to be able to understand and think and just appreciate it as a tool. But it is a great way to check your work and to give you a, a head start on being able to figure out a problem where you're not quite sure which direction to go. It can give you a hint because you might be able to figure out the answer before you even work towards it. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.